Hey guys and welcome to Aussie Reviews. Well, unfortunately we've been rained out the last couple of days here on the farm, so it's put a halt to me actually getting out and doing the firearm reviews. So apologies for that, we'll certainly get a lot more done shortly. I've got some really cool stuff I'm looking at at the moment. If you've been following us on Facebook and Instagram, you'd see a um, sneak peek of that. Now guys, uh, the purpose of this video today is to uh, bring awareness about being, what in my view is, the last Australian shooter. Now the problem here in Australia in my view is that in 1996 we had a lot of um, restrictive gun laws placed upon us and as a licensed shooter at the time um, you know I certainly didn't agree with a lot of it. Now at the time our Prime Minister John Howard actually said and I will actually quote this I've got it written here guys so I don't mistake it any word of it. So 1996 and this has come from the uh, PM transcripts his words were I have also heard suggestions, for example, that the whole idea of this is to bring about the complete disarming of the Australian population. I've heard people make suggestions that this is the first step in some kind of march along the road to the deprivation of people's individual liberties. I want to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, that this is a totally unreasonable, it is a totally inaccurate, and it is a totally discredited response to the decision that has been taken by the government, okay? Now that's what John Howard said at the time to get these gun laws across the line with a lot of um, shooters here in Australia. But unfortunately, you know, I'm of the age where I remember 1996 very well, and ever since then, all I've seen is complete opposite. I have seen disarmament of licensed shooters numerous, numerous times. Now if we look at the definition meaning of disarmament, you know, depending on which dictionary you look at, but it's pretty much the same. Disarmament or disarming means to take weapons from people or something. So where I feel that's relevant to us as shooters is let's have a look at the restrictions that we've had since 1996. It was the early 2000s and we had the Monash University shooting with handguns. So then there was all these restrictions placed on sports shooting with handguns here in Australia. Now, we don't have handguns here in Australia for recreational shooting. However, we do still have them in some areas of Australia for occupational shooting, such as primary production. So in uh, the early 2000s, we had uh, bans on calibers over 38. Um, we also had uh, 10 round magazine limits uh, placed upon us. And we also had minimal barrel length uh, restrictions placed upon us as well. Then after that, we had uh, caliber restrictions on bolt action firearms. So, you know, over in WA, for example, they had a lot of issues there with uh, applying for a 300 win mag. People were getting uh, letters from their licensing division over there saying that uh, basically um, a show cause, why should you want such a uh, high powered uh, weapon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we also had that here in Queensland, you know, like uh, 338 Lapua and above, and most states around Australia uh, do have restrictions, you know, on that. But this is the thing, back in 1996, I mean, these calibers were, were available. I mean, 338 Lapua was available, and the government uh, didn't decide to uh, ban any of the, um, those calibers back then. But this has all since come in, and without incident. Then the next thing they did was uh, magazine restrictions. Now I can speak for Queensland because I'm obviously located in Queensland. So as a licensed shooter here, I've had uh, restrictions placed upon me um, with uh, bolt action rifles, centerfire uh, being limited to 15 round uh, detachable magazines. So, you know, if you had like a um, 20 round AR mag that fits like, um, you know, the Mossberg um, MVP, for example, or something that takes like an AR mag, well, all of a sudden you are limited to 15 rounds. Then you have a look at the uh, centerfire lever and pump action rifles. There's also restrictions to um, 10 round detachable magazines there. So once again, my question is, is, well, was there any incident with someone using a 15 round magazine or a 20 round magazine? Um, to my knowledge, there certainly wasn't, and yet we still have these restrictions placed upon us. I mean, you go to New South Wales, I mean, they've even got restrictions on uh, rimfire magazines down there. So, you know, each state is different. Then uh, the one that most of us will be familiar with is the Adler shotgun debacle and the whole reclassification of uh, lever action shotguns from uh, basically category A to anything up to five rounds is now category B. 
and anything over five rounds jumps right up to category D. Now category D, for those of you who don't know, is pretty much limited to semi-automatic centerfire rifles and also uh, semi-automatic and pump shotguns um, over five rounds and also semi-auto rimfire rifles that are over 10 rounds. That's all in category D there. Uh, then we go on again. We've got uh, cosmetic appearance laws. Now, in some states, you can't even have a bolt-action rifle with a pistol grip. You know, that's banned. Um, you know, if you've got a, uh, um, an adjustable stock, that's also banned in some states as well. All these cosmetic appearances apply to manually operated firearms that, you know, aren't, aren't semi-auto, yet they get reclassified just simply on appearance, not function, the actual appearance of them, and put into category D as well. So they're essentially completely banned. Then uh, the latest thing that we've got now, guys, is uh, this fight uh, here in Queensland where they're trying to uh, ban and restrict uh, gel blaster toy guns. Yep, that's right. Toy guns, gel blasters. Because why? Because cosmetically they look like the real thing and uh, that's what they want to uh, basically bring in restrictions on. But my personal view on it, it's a slippery slope. They'll try to get it over the line by just saying, look, it's just restricted, but then you watch. Watch once they start pushing for a license, and then there'll probably be PTAs and so forth, because it's all about controlling everything and obviously getting their cut from it, which means money. So yeah, guys, it's been continual disarmament in my view as a licensed shooter since 1996. If anybody disagrees, I mean, feel free to comment um, because I've clearly spelled out what disarm or disarmament means, the dictionary meaning, and I've listed various things that have been taken off us. So I really don't know how that isn't disarmament. But uh, anyhow, if someone wants to comment to the contrary, uh, please uh, feel free to do so. Now guys, what I'm gonna read now is uh, a post that I did back in uh, oh, May 2016 on my Facebook page there about what my view is as a licensed shooter. And uh, basically it was called, Don't Be The Last Australian Shooter. Now in that, and I will read it to you in just a moment, but in that I talk about various things of what I think um, is going to be the predicted future, but also I list things that have already happened to us. So let me take a moment now just to read that to you. First, they came for the military type semi-autos, but that didn't affect me because I didn't need them. Then they came for all semi-auto centerfire and rimfire rifles, and even shotguns in 1996, but that didn't affect me either, as I was happy to hunt with my old Winchester 3030, so I remained silent. Then they came for the handguns in 2002, and banned magazines over 10 rounds, barrels shorter than 127 millimeters, and restricted calibers over 38. But that didn't bother me either, as I wasn't into pistol shooting. Then they came for rifles that cosmetically looked like anything that was a semi-auto, even if it was a manually operated straight pull. So they took all rifles with pistol grips, adjustable stocks, and anything else that was black in appearance. But I still felt safe because I knew they couldn't possibly take my old Winchester 3030, so I said nothing. Then they came for bolt action, pump action, and lever action rifles that had magazines over 10 or 15 rounds, but I knew I was still all right with my guns. Then they came for rifles with calibers over 308 because they were regarded as powerful sniper rifles and no one needed them, but still that didn't affect me either, so I remained silent. Then they came for lever action shotguns and took them away under the catchphrase of rapid fire weapons, but thankfully I still got to keep my 3030. Then they came for all lever and pump action rifles because they fell into the emotional definition of rapid fire weapons. So I finally had to say goodbye to my beloved rifle that represented the only last memories I had of my dad when he was alive as we used to go on hunting trips with this rifle. I asked other shooters for help but everyone was running scared, hanging onto their bolt action rifles so nothing was said. Then they came for the remaining pistols starting with disarming the farmers and occupational shooters, then removing them from sports shooters. I didn't worry too much because I still have my bolt action 22 that no one could ever take from me. 
Then they came for the double barrel and single barrel shotguns because they were too powerful in the hands of civilians, but that didn't affect me and my bolt action 22, so I remained silent. Then they came for the last of them, the bolt action rimfire and centerfire rifles, saying that we have to do this to ensure public safety. There is no other way, and justifying their actions because of a criminal who held up a service station using an unregistered cut-down bolt-action rifle. I tried to speak out, but it was too late. We'd all been taken apart little by little, and our numbers were no more for our voice to be heard. Instead of standing together when the pistols were being confiscated, the rifle and shotgun shooters all ran into hiding, laughing with each other, just happy that it wasn't them that were being targeted. But then came their turn and the pistol shooters weren't going to help the shotgun and rifle shooters. So we all eventually lost firearms little by little, piece by piece as the years went on. I wish I could share with you, my boy, the days that your granddad and I used to go hunting and bring home a freshly butchered deer. The whole family would sit round the dinner table enjoying beautiful cuts of venison backstraps with fresh vegetables from the garden. I wish I could share with you the experience of going out with your first 22 and taking a rabbit for the evening meal, but I can't as we were all disarmed many years ago. This is The Last Australian Shooter. So guys, I hope that um, hits home with you because it certainly does with me and that's why I wrote it. Now, what can you actually do about it? The biggest problem that I have is with people who are into shooting, who will sit there ranting and swearing and carrying on like a two bob watch. But then when you dig deep, you can see that they've done absolutely nothing. They've never met with any local members of parliament, um, both state or federal. Um, you know, they haven't written any letters. They haven't asked for any appointments. Um, have they come up with any sort of ideas to you know, um, get their friends to come with them to meet with local members of parliament or do they uh, run any sort of range days to encourage people to come into, um, you know, uh, shooting? You know, do you take friends to the range? All that sort of thing. Um, you know, there's so many steps that all of us as shooters could be doing to, you know, enhance the uh, true picture of uh, legal licensed uh, firearm ownership. So, yeah, it really frustrates me, guys. Um, I mean, even when, you know, I did that post recently about, uh, James Ryder and the difficulties that he's had in obtaining a suppressor, you know, so we thought, okay, well, let's get this sorted. Um, let's fight this all the way in court. You know, this is where every shooter, in my view, needs to unite as one, donate to the cause and help create some case law that can be used for other shooters to start applying. But the comments that even on that video from people, you know, one of the biggest comments was this should be Australia wide. Well, yeah, I, I agree but you can't just suddenly pull out a magic wand and make it happen if you haven't actually applied in your state and been rejected so that you can then fight that in court. You can't just rock up to court without an actual fight. There's gotta be something there that you're fighting to win. So you need to get off, off your backside, apply and get the rejection and then you can approach um, you know, a uh, organization like Shooters Union to be able to help you in your state to fight. Okay, and that's what it's about. Um, also, too, the other thing was, uh, uh, you know, people commented and said, well, why is it just for occupational shooters? All shooters should have access to suppressors. Correct, I agree. But once again, you've got to take this step by step. You can't just go the whole hog straight away. We need to create that case law. So then, for example, a sports shooter can then apply and also um, get the knockback and then fight that in court as well. Okay, so you just can't wave a magic wand. And this is what I find really frustrating with, with uh, shooters is they'll whinge, carry on, swear, moan, all the rest of it, but nothing ever gets done. Nothing ever changes. Um, you know, like they'll whinge about the organizations. And look, uh, organizations aren't perfect. I, I get that. I understand that. And I've certainly had my complaints in the past with uh, various organizations that I've been a member of. Now, do you just uh, continue to whinge and then just throw in the towel? Or do you actually get out there and do something? So what I mean is like get out there in force. You know, when you've got um, different pro-gun parties 
on election day. Get out there and hand out the how to vote cards. I don't care if they don't get elected. At least you've done something and continue to do something. Take more people to the range. Introduce them into uh, you know shooting. And most importantly, go in numbers to your local member, both state and federal. So when I say in numbers, get a group of you know 10 of your other friends who live in the electorate. Get them to go along and calmly and, and respectfully talk about your position on firearm ownership and explain to them, well, if they support any restrictions, you won't vote for them anymore. It's as simple as that. We have all these legal avenues in a democracy, but unfortunately, guys, shooters are their worst own enemy and they sit there and they whinge and complain, but they're not willing to do anything. Okay, so that's the reason for this video, guys. Um, look, I really hope that uh, everyone joins in and unites as one for not only this suppressor fight, but also for all fights for firearms. It doesn't matter what state it's in. We need people to start standing up and being leaders and doing something. And then the other people that really uh, you know, don't know what to do, well, they'll follow. So guys, please stand up for our sport, and our hobby and our recreation, because in my view, we will become the last Australian shooter.